So let me start by giving you an outline for the evening. I'm going to do a quick little introduction here, and then um, we'll get started straight away with the presentation from Tom Landis. And um, for folks who don't know Tom, I want to read you his um, short bio that he sent me. So Tom is uh, retired from 30 years with the U.S. Forest Service. And um, he was a nursery specialist with the Forest Service. Um, he has been creating pollinator habitat by growing and planting native milkweed and other nectar plants um, in Monarch Way Stations. He's a founding member of the Western Monarch Advocates, and he's given over 115 monarch and milkweed workshops in recent years. And uh, just like us here at the Siskiyou Land Trust, this is Tom's first Zoom event. Um, so thank you all for joining us on our um, first ever virtual experience. I want to tell you a little bit about Siskiyou Land Trust. We are the local land trust for Siskiyou County. We work on land conservation uh, with private landowners, and typically that's with conservation easements. We also work on community projects here in Mount Shasta. We have several open space and trails and greenway projects that we work with a variety of partners on. Sisson Meadow is one of our signature projects here in Mount Shasta. We've got some restoration projects lined up for that. And um, one of those restoration projects is to do some native pollinator um, plant plantings in the meadow. And um, we really look to Soma and Tom's material to um, put together a planting palette to do some monarch way stations in the meadow. Um, I think I've shared everything that I need to share with you um, to get this event started. So what I'm going to do now is turn it over to Tom Landis, who has put so much energy um, into Monarch Way Station projects. We've seen photos of his backyard of where he's done a lot of work and then so much other work, um, I'm sure around Southern Oregon and possibly farther. And um, we really are going to get so much information tonight and see some beautiful pictures. So with that, I will turn it over to Tom. Thanks everyone for being here. Okay, let's see if we can get this PowerPoint running. There we go. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for participating. Thanks for signing on. As Renee said, this is my first Zoom uh, Monarch and Milkweed workshop, so we're all learning together. But uh, uh, this is pretty much going to follow what I do in my in-person workshops. As it says there, I'm a retired U.S. Forest Service nursery specialist. Real important there, I'm not an entomologist. I thought I'd start with a little bit of Zoom humor. Someone sent me this uh, Zoom at the Last Supper. So, <laughs> what we're going to cover in this workshop uh, four different topics. First of all, just some basic biology of monarchs. Uh, what's the difference between Western monarchs and Eastern monarchs? Section two, what happened to the Western monarchs? And the main section will be three here creating pollinator habitat with monarch way stations. That's the real reason we're here. And then finally, what can we do to help all types of pollinators? So, starting out with no, section number one, basic biology. Well, there are basically two populations of monarchs in the United States, the Western monarchs and Eastern monarchs. Uh, I'll say right up front that the uh, movie we're going to be seeing is about the Eastern monarchs, the ones that uh, fly down here to, to Mexico to overwinter. Our Western monarchs are different. They're basically west of the Rocky Mountains here. And instead of going to Mexico, they fly down to the coast of California. Um, and that's where they winter. So it's, it's a little different. There is some mixing down here between the Eastern and Western populations and with the tagging that our groups and other groups are doing. We're learning more about that all the time. But it's interesting, as you can see on the slide there, there's really no genetic differences between the populations. It's a mechanism, but yet they know where to go. So it's just another uh, kind of really really neat thing about how these small insects know where to go and where to return to each year. Uh, they lay eggs individually, one egg at a time. 
and only on milkweed. That's why you always hear about monarchs and milkweeds together. So that's what they call the host plant. It's the only plant that the, the female monarch can lay eggs on. So the egg takes about three or four days to hatch, and then they hatch into this beautiful caterpillars that, that I'm sure you've seen. Uh, hopefully we'll be seeing more this year. And they go through five instars or five growth phases over two weeks. And then they go into the chrysalises, which is really where the magic happens. So they spin this cocoon, stay in there about 10 to 14 days, where they eclose into the adult butterfly. And so the, the entire life cycle takes about six to 10 weeks during the summer, but the adult uh, monarch only uh, lives for about, about a month. So uh, that's pretty interesting. Uh, the, the generations are really important because we'll be coming back to that because that has a lot to do with what we're going to be talking about and, and why the monarch populations are in are in such a dire strait. So the monarchs, as we said, go down to California coast where they overwinter uh, right along the coast where they're uh, not subject to freezing temperatures. And when it starts getting warm in the spring, the, the monarchs mate usually around February. And then after they mate, the female goes out and starts looking for milkweed. So that's the first generation, usually about March to April. And again, that only takes about six to 10 weeks. And that's entirely in California. They don't fly any further than maybe the, the foothills of the Sierra. They don't get out of California, that generation. Then those, the, the progeny of that first generation becomes the second generation about May and June. And as I'll show you in a second here, we, those are the ones we start seeing up here. Then there's a summer uh, a generation in July and August. And each one of these, again, they, the uh, total uh, Life cycle only takes about six to 10 weeks. So again, they lay egg, uh, the third generation midsummer. And then the real interesting one is here in the fall. So when the days start getting short in say August and September, uh, the, the last uh, generation, which we call the super generation, these are the ones that will head south, fly back, back to California, uh, all winter hanging upside down in a eucalyptus or a Monterey uh, cypress. And uh, then they're the ones that start this whole thing over again. So it's four generations that make, make it happen. And it's just amazing that they know where to go. Like, so that's like going back to where your great, great grandparents were from. So that generation knows where to go back to the California coast. The pie chart up here in the, on, the, on the shows basically when, in, when we would expect to see monarchs here in Northern California or Southern Oregon. April's probably stretching it. We just, we have seen one case where we did have uh, some monarchs right at the end of April, but generally I, I've noticed mostly June through September is when you'll see monarchs flying around. Maybe you'd, you'd find an egg or a caterpillar. And then in October and November, that's when they, the super generation starts flying back to the California coast. And then December through March, that's when they're in the overwintering stage. So we would mainly see them May through September. Uh, this chart here on the left shows the one, two, three, four, those are the generations. So you can see that only uh, the first generation only occurs here in California, but then here in Northern California, Southern Oregon, we'll see the second, third and generations. And it, up into Washington, they only get a couple of generations, same here with Idaho. Uh, if you want to follow the migration, there are a couple of great ways, but on Facebook, there's uh, David James says monarch butterflies in the Pacific Northwest, so you can, he actually posts about where he's found some of his tagged monarchs. And then there's a great website called Journey North that you can Google up, and they actually show a front. So right now they're showing where the monarchs are coming up from the south, most in the eastern, both in the eastern and western populations. Monarchs, I think you're probably all here because you realize there's a problem, and that's certainly why I got involved. So these are the, the, the way that monarch populations are, are uh, monitored is when they fly down to the overwintering sites along the California coast, they don't move around. And of course, they're in one place, so they're easy to count. And volunteers from the Xerxes Society and Thanksgiving uh, come in and they actually have a very elaborate system for sampling and determining how many monarchs are, are, are overwintering that year. You can see from this chart that back in the 90s, so 1997 was kind of the high water mark for the Western monarchs. From then on, it's just been downhill ever since. And after about, say, 2003, it kind of was just up and down. We were there. But then look what happened in the last two years, 2008, 
2019, the population had a further crash, which for, all, for those of us working in monarchs was really devastating. I started in 2013, you can see here, the next year there were a few more, more than the 15, more than 16, and then it started to drop, and then the last two years it's been an absolute catastrophe. So why did that happen? That's what we're gonna try and talk about here in the next, in the next few minutes in this section. Before we do that, though, I just wanted to put, give some good news. It's not all dire. Uh, the good news is that creating poll pollinator habitat does work. And this is a photo here is at Coyote Trails in, in, here in, in Medford. It's a monarch way station that we created. Uh, we created it in 2015. Actually, in the, about April, we planted milkweed plants and other nectar plants here right along Bear Creek. And the, in the September of that year, we were doing kind of a show me tour at Coyote Trails, and I was pointing out where the milkweed was, where the nectar plants were. And one of the people that was attending, a, a fellow from the Fish and Wildlife Service, looks down and he goes, Well, here's a caterpillar. So we actually found two caterpillars that first year. So think of this we planted the milkweed in April, May, June, July, August, September. Five months later, we found caterpillar. My co founder for Soma, he actually took those caterpillars home, raised them brought them back, there happened to be a school group there. We tagged the monarchs, let them go. Uh, that was about in October. And then in January of the next year, they, so they were down here overwintering in California, David James, who we'll talk about more in a little bit on New Year's Day, uh, found one of our two monarchs down here in Belize, California, overwintering. So pretty amazing. Not only did we get caterpillars and, and monarch butterflies the first year, but they migrated back to their overwinter sites. So our SOMA group, a lot of people uh, get involved, uh, quite a few people that raise monarchs, and this is just some data from mine. Uh, again, to show you what happened in this last couple of years. So I started actually like in 2013, but it is from 2016 to 19. And you can see during the months of the summer when I found the caterpillars or, or eggs and totals were for the year, but you can see 156, 312, 135, and then in 2019, 10 is all I found. So last year was quite depressed. Quite a few of our SOMA members didn't even see a monarch last year. So we we're all very concerned. And David James is a picture shown here. He's a he's on the staff at Washington State University where he, he works with viniculture and other crops, but he donates his time to our to our group. He's a member of SOMA and he's our monarch guru to, to give us the, the science. So every year he takes his uh, he takes his family down on Memorial Day weekend along the Trinity River and they actually spend that weekend looking for monarchs. So they look for eggs or actually uh, how many monarchs per hour and that's what this chart here shows. So starting in 2012 you can see there was a big uh, peak here in 2015 and 16 and then just as we saw in the overwintering numbers a total crash and really sadly, 2019, David, David and his family saw no monarchs at all coming up along the Trinity River. So obviously something is happening down, happening down in California. Well, this has been kind of our mantra at our, work, at our workshops, uh, uh, Southern Oregon Mon Advocates, plant milkweed and they will come. And uh, I don't know how people I told that to, and I've had people write back and say, oh yeah, I did. And, I, I planted some milkweed and I found some caterpillars and I, I raised some monarchs. Uh, I'm really not saying that anymore because as you can see, we've had something really nicely happening down in California. Uh, creating monarch way stations here in Oregon or nor Northern California don't help if monarchs don't migrate up. So we know something is happening. And just from our the group that our, our the observations that our SOMA people did, we knew something was happening down in California. And that turns out to be verified by the research scientists. So there's been a couple of big reports done recently on the Western Monarch Butterfly. Uh, the Western Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies uh, did a 10-year plan, a Western Monarch Butterfly Conservation Plan. The Environmental Defense Fund uh, had a big meeting in uh, D UC Davis in 2019. And interestingly enough, uh, they pretty much came to the same conclusion, which is always nice to see. So this is just some of the quotes from their report. Uh, one of the main thing that's happening in down in California is overwintering habitat loss. Uh, 
The Western monarch highly vulnerable during overwintering, which I'm sure you can all appreciate. And remaining in the, uh, the remaining overwintering, but that's on the grid. Just as one example, this is a overhead, a, 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 a overhead photo of Lighthouse Field in Santa Cruz. That's in this little yellow square there. It's very quite small, 3.4 acres. In 1997, they had 70,000 monarch in the overwintering counts, went down to 12,000 in 2017. 2018, they're about 1,700, and about the same from last year. So again, you can see from that that really there's something wrong. We're, we're just, they're not surviving the winter. So one of the things that all the reports have pointed out is that climate change is affecting many aspects of monarch behavior. Uh, specifically, that means that the, the uh, springs are getting warmer, uh, the monarchs are leaving the overwintering grounds earlier. Before I said it was usually of February or March when they mated and went out looking for milk, and now it's in February or even January because of the warmer temperatures. And the problem is, is they're, they're mating and leaving the overwintering sites, but they're not finding, finding any milkweed to, to lay uh, to eggs on, lay eggs on. So that, that's a real serious problem. And then in the fall, uh, monarchs are making the return migration later in the year, and I've seen that here too. So I'm seeing monarchs coming through here in October and even well into November when they should already be down in California. So again, the warmers are making them stay longer up north. And the scientists think, and I, I think it's true, they're, they're not finding flower at that time of year, late October into November, and so nectar availability can be severely limited. And of course, insecticides, uh, the, probably the most hard to prove, but I think all of us who've been being with monarchs for any time at all realize there's definitely something going on. And I just wanted to refer back to Silent Spring. I'm sure it was a book that really affected me. It came out when I was in high school, I remember. And I remember my high school biology teacher being really uh, really excited about it. And so I actually went back and read it just a few years ago. And it was about DDT, which came out during the Second World War. It was going to be the miracle insecticide. And Rachel Carson noticed problems. And so she made it her crusade to let people know. And I like this one quote. It was published in 1962. And of course, the chemical companies were up in arms. They called her an ignorant hysterical woman, which is quite a stretch for sure. So, but due to her work, DDT was banned in 1972, and since then, uh, the raptors, the bald eagles, peregrine falcons, and stuff that were severely uh, damaged by the weakened eggs, if you remember that, they have come back, so it does work. But so nowadays, it's not DDT, it's neonicotinoids, and you might not have heard that, but it's a new, a new chemical. Uh, you've probably heard of nicotine, like in, it, it's a poisonous substance found in, found in, in, in uh, cigarettes other tobacco products, but they've synthesized this and they've made a synthetic uh, insecticide that moves through the plant, and that's why it's so deadly, is they can apply it to the potting media, they can apply, apply it to the seed in the plant, and then takes up this neonicotinoid and it spreads all the way through the, the plant, even up to the pollen and the nectar, and so that's what causes problems with bees. Uh, We've heard about colony collapse disorder and some of those things. Very, we're pretty sure that's that's limited to this. And with with monarchs, the sublethal effect. So it doesn't actually kill them, but it disorient disorients them. So uh, they found that bees have a hard time finding a way back to the hive after uh, ingesting neonicotinoids. Well, you can imagine what would happen with a a very mobile organism like a monarch butterfly who's flying around and if they get disoriented that can really uh, that, that would really be catastrophic. So I think we know what's happening to them. We realize things happening down with the overwintering and then in the early first generation. So what can we do here in Northern California and Southern Oregon? So the bulk of my will be creating pollinator habit with monarch waste stations. Uh, this is a sign that I made out of an interpretive sign that talks about what we're trying to do in a monarch way station. What we're trying to do is create habitat, food, shelter, and water. Uh, 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 the food, the basic food I already told you, was the monarch 
I was the uh, milkweed. So we try and plant native milkweeds. Uh, here in Oregon, you can see when I started in 2013, we had about 15 registered waste stations. Uh, in 2020, we had 160. So about a tenfold increase uh, since we got started. So if you do put in Monarch waste stations, I would really encourage you to uh, register them with Monarch Watch. Well, there's two types of waste stations uh, in your backyard gardens, which most people who come to my, my workshops are interested in starting a pollinator garden in their backyard or an adjacent lot or something. Because we don't want any uh, plants to get away and become a pest, we're going to use only native plants. So that's important. So only native plants on wildland areas. The community scale monarch waste station we have here in Southern Oregon, uh, County, County Trails Nature Center. If you're ever down here, right off of I-5 where you see those big ball fields as you're traveling up towards Medford, that's right down along Bear Creek. So the, the, the beauty of these, and I'm, I'm sure you're right there in, in, in Mount Shasta, is they're really visible to the public. So when we're down there working, weeding, planting, like I'm doing the spring, people come by, we get a chance to talk to them. So it, right on the bike trail is excellent excellent chance to uh, to tell people what we're doing to share the message the importance of pollinator habitat this uh when i was down there uh collecting seed one time i looked down in the narrow leaf milkweed and there was a there was a, a monarch that, that he closed several years ago so it always something going on there okay so the heart of the art of the monarch way station is what we call a plant palette which is just a range of the various plants that we're going to use for our project. And again, the heart of the Monarch Way Station are milkweed, and we have two native species of milkweed, which I'll tell you a little bit more about here in a second. So we want those again because that's what the uh, monarch butterfly will lay eggs on, what the caterpillars can eat. But then we want nectar through the entire season. So we break them down, nectar flowers, uh, spring flowering. Right now, I'm sure you all know what Oregon grape is. Uh, I was just up on the hill behind my house and saw a lot of bumblebees nectaring on, on Oregon grape. Uh, summer flowering plants, uh, coyote mint is a really, really good nectar plant for midsummer. Uh, these are all, by the way, listed in the book that Renee mentioned there, the pollinator plants for Southern Oregon. And then more, most importantly in the fall, we want plants that will flower when the um, monarchs are migrating through. Either Monarchs that have uh, enclosed here and are getting ready to go south or ones that are coming through from further north, they're looking for a source of nectar to fuel their, their journey down to a uh, California coast, but also to, uh, to tide them through the winter because they can't, they can't nectar through the winter. Real briefly, host, host plants, the host plant for the monarch butterfly, they eat only milkweed leaves, so that's real important. Uh, it's kind of interesting that the monarch butterfly co-evolved with the milkweed, so it's, it's the only one that they can eat that can actually take up the poisons in the milkweed plant and use that for defense against birds and other predators. Pretty cool. Well, the milkweeds that are native to our area, both here and in, in Northern California, uh, the most common one up here is narrow leaf milkweed, and as you can see here on the picture, it does have very narrow leaves and kind of a oh, maybe 16 to 18 inches tall, up to two feet maybe, not real tall. Uh, and they have kind of a whitish, small whitish flower. Um, not only are the leaves narrow, but the seed pods, which you can see here, you can see them splitting open to let out the seeds. They're also quite narrow. And uh, I have both these species in my way station. Found in my way station, the monarch females actually prefer the narrow leaf for laying eggs on. Uh, and they're moderately rhizomatous, so milkweed not only spreads by seed, but it can also spread, you know, like iris can or other, other plants through the rhizome. So it will uh, a little new garden, so you have to take that into account. Uh, this is the one that's more common down around Mount Shasta. I know I've seen it out on the weed plains there, and right along I-5 going through town. This is a showy milkweed. Uh, if you look back between those two, you could hardly imagine that they're even related. Look at that. Narrow leaf milkweed, a showy milkweed, but the showy is quite a more robust plant up to three, uh, two and a half, three feet tall. It's highly rhizominous, which means it'll, it will spread uh, laterally. After you plant one plant, it'll begin to creep out and, and spread more. Uh, the, the follicles or the seed pods are, are quite big and, and bumpy. 
uh, much bigger than the, the narrow leaf. And I, I like that on the, the way station. The, the female will lay eggs on the, on the showy, uh, but when I'm feeding my caterpillars, I found the uh, large leaves are much better for that because uh, one person in my class, the large caterpillars, before they go into pupation, they eat like teenage boys. They really go through, really go through the milkweed. Uh, if you're going to use milkweed, and I really stress this in my, in my classes, use local milkweed. Uh, this map here shows showy milkweed, the range is it's native to all over the western U.S. from say Illinois all the way to California and up to Washington State. So you would not want to get seed from say Nebraska and uh, showy milkweed seed and bring it out here. So that's why we have these eco regions. We use those as seed zones and you can see this M261 here just shows that Northern California, Southern Oregon, Orion, we're in the same uh, eco region. So it's, it's okay for me to bring plants down here. When I've given workshops, and I'll bring seed and, and rhizomes down there. But by the same token, I would not take seeds from here and take them, say, to Bend or up to Portland if I'm doing a shop up there. I would want them to use local seed. And so I give a workshop, I always find out where they can get that. Again, nectar plants. Uh, this shows that proboscis really well, hollow feeding tube they put down in the flower. So they get that sugar from the flower. That's, uh, that's where they get all their energy. Uh, sugar content ranges from 8 to 52%. So compare that to like the old Coca-Cola with sugar was 10% sugar. So it's really an energy food drink. Uh, when I started making my palette for my way station, I, we have a lot of California poppies. I know they're in Northern California. And I read that in a book, it has no nectar. It's, it's one of the unique things about California poppy. It has pollen, of course, but no nectar. So I wasn't really using it in my way stations, even though it grows really well. But then the more I read is it's a pollen plant for, for bees, because the bees, they take nectar, but they also take the uh, pollen back and make bee bread for their brood. So I, I've changed my mind. I've learned and I've added it back into the mix. So you'll never see a butterfly on California poppy, but you'll see lots of bees like this bumblebee or other native bees. They love it. Well, the, interest, the important thing here then in the fall, we, I said that we want to make sure that there's a lot of fall blooming plants. Uh, this monarch here was in my backyard on Augustaki and he spent four hours flying up and resting in the tree, coming down, and he's full afternoon nectaring on this plant. And what he was doing was storing up food in their body. And I don't have many graphs, but I think this is really illustrative because here in the summer, the lipid stored in the body of the monarch butterflies down to around 20. Look what happens in September, November, December. So in the three months of the fall, the stored fat in a monarch butterfly's body is seven times 20 to 40. And then, of course, they use that. They don't feed during the winter. They uh, metabolize that stored energy, and that's how they get through the winter to start up the next generation. The shelter, woody trees and shrubs, this is my backyard with my way station, and you can see that there's a lot of trees. There's a, a hedge over here, and I've noticed that, uh, especially in midsummer, the thing that monarchs really need during the heat of the day is a place to get out of the heat like this monarch here is on one of my lilac bushes. So he actually was sitting there cooling off. So I'll see them cruise through here, but on a hot afternoon, over 100 degrees, they need a place to get cooled off. And so they'll come and they will rest. And so not only from wind or rain, which you think of for, with, with uh, protection, but also from the heat here in our climate. And of course, water. A lot of the guys might have seen a bunch of butterflies like this in one spot on the ground, maybe on a wet patch. What they're actually doing is taking up water, but they're also getting sodium. So it's pretty much like a salt lake. When I first started working, I was working with Susie Savoy. We decided we would actually develop our own homegrown uh, uh, list of, of pollinator plants. So we actually had this made up and uh, our SOMA group actually gets them published. We come at our workshops for $15 just to cover the price of, of printing. But if you want the PDF file, uh, it's freely available for downloading. And, and we'll be sharing that with you as, as part of this course. If you'd like to just download it, it'll show you where to go to get that, uh, that publication. Uh, anyway, so uh, early blooming nectar plants are really important, not only for bumblebees, which if you read, read about them, the, 
the female bee in the fall of the year mates in the fall of the year, then actually digs a, a little hole in the ground and makes a tunnel and spends the, the, the winter there resting. And then they come out very early in the spring and only the females over winter. And so these females who have already mated begin to look for sources of nectar. And as this picture here uh, goes that Angela took, uh, again on Oregon grapes. So you, you'll see them buzzing around and they're getting that, that nectar of the spring, early spring flowers, and that's what they use and they'll, and they'll form their brood. So it's really critical that you have early blooming plants for these, for the bumblebees, which overwinter. Then also there are several other uh, species of, of butterfly. Uh, David James took these pictures with this tortoise shell and he's actually up on a willow. And I bet a lot of you didn't know that willow, pussy willows, natives, both the male and the female uh, flowers, catkins, actually have nectar. And that's what you can see right there. Uh, morning cloak is an interesting butterfly. That's this one right here. They overwinter as adults. So not all, not all uh, butterflies fly south. These are the ones that stay around here actually overwinter as adults. And uh, John Davis took this picture. Uh, he, he, he was excited because he actually got the monarch or the morning cloak to, to light on this twig. And when he looked down here, you could actually see it laying eggs on this twig. So, so they overwinter and they need that, that early source of nectar to have energy to start their next generation. Well, there's a lot of fall blooming natives, uh, like I've shown you here, that, that are really good for butterflies. Uh, sulfur flower buckwheat, buckwheat, which I'm sure you've seen with the checker spots. Goldenrod is another good one. Uh, one that I was kind of surprised, but it's turned out to be a great one, is rubber rabbit brush, which we have a lot here in the, uh, in the interior, dry interior west. But as you can see there, uh, it's a really good source of nectar for monarchs and other, and other insects. And then uh, asters, a whole range of asters bloom late into the fall. You can see these buckeye butterflies nectaring on those there. Well, one thing that kind of surprised me once I got further into creating pollinator gardens, I read this article on native only wildlife gardens, star fall pollinators. And these photos here are my direct observation. In late October, it's almost uh, Halloween, 2007, I was walking the dog up dogs up above my house uh, here in Medford. And the only thing that blo was blooming was this black night butterfly bush. There were no native plants blooming at all. And uh, in those next few days, I saw three different monarchs nectaring on those, uh, trying to get down to California site. Uh, again, buckeye. So there were a lot of butterflies. So again, I think it's due to climate change. They're not flying south as early as they used to did, used to do. And so the, the insects are out of sync with the, the plants. They're staying longer after the native plants have quit blooming. So in my backyard, again, this is not a native plant, and a lot of people uh, question the use of butterfly bush, but I've started using it in my yard gardens, and I encourage people to do it because things are changing, and we have to take care of these insects. Otherwise, they, there, there's no way the monarchs would ever make it down. Again, non-native but non-invasive pollinator plants for backyard gardens. Uh, the butterfly bush, I've got two different types. New England aster, which is native to the U.S., not out here. Again, it blooms right up to where it really starts to freezing. Chthonia Mexican flower is an excellent, excellent one. This purple top vervain and Augustaki uh, is a great nectar plant in my garden. One of the ones I see the most use of. One thing I wanted to, as we're kind of wrapping things up here, everyone gets excited about creating way stations and they get volunteers, can you get to plant, dig in the soil, that's always a big, a fun time. But then a year later, two years later, when you're trying to maintain the garden, uh, that's when you really need to, you need some volunteers. So I just thought I'd show you what happened on one of my way stations. Uh, here, this was in April, 2019. This arrow shows some little showy milkweed, which have just pushed push through the soil and look at the grasses way over top. So I actually went over there, hand weeded all that, and I put down a real thick mulch, organic mulch, as you can see here. So this is this year, in fact, just a few weeks ago, I went over there, hardly any weeds, because the mulch kept them down, and here are the showy milkweeds popping their way up through. So I can't, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of putting down a good mulch not only to keep the weeds down, 
uh, but also to, uh, to to maintain the soil moisture because I'm sure you know we're going into a pretty pretty good drought, unfortunately. Again, uh, the last few slides here, assessing pollinator value by direct observation. And this is something that I, this is Annie White. She was a PhD student from Northeast somewhere in one of the universities back there. And she did her whole dissertation on obser observing which plants, uh, the, the butterflies and, and insects actually came and actually tallying them down. And her research showed here that uh, echinacea, which is a native plant to the Midwest, she uh, had that one and then she used three cultivars, cultivated varieties. One was white one, one was sunrise, kind of a pinkish one, I guess, or red, reddish one, and then there's a pink double delight. And you can just see here, average pollinator visit, the native plants and bees. And we've generally found that to be true. Uh, just from your own uh, area here, uh, Glenn Fine, who lives in Weed, uh, posted this on Facebook, and I was just so so excited. I tried to I found out where his uh, email address, and I thanked him very much. But he actually listed down the top ten, or I think there are even more than that. Again, pollinator species visits, and of all things, uh, spreading dog vein, dog vein was the most most visited. Thistles are right up there. Asters. So there are some good information right from Northern California uh, 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 available on the internet. Okay, well that's, that's about wrapping up what I had. Uh, finally then, what can we do to help pollinators? Well, just what we've been talking about, our, our poor world here is in pretty bad shape, not only with the COVID virus, but the, the drought we're going into, there's a lot of challenges uh, that are not only reducing the number of, of uh, monarchs, but all, all insects. I'm sure you've seen the insect apocalypse. There's been articles like that in newspapers and in Time Magazine. All insects are really suffering a, a population decline right now. So creating habitat is something that we as gardeners can do. And it's, it's good for us as well. It's very therapeutic to go work in the garden. And I just wanted to say it's, it's, it's more than just monarchs. Way stations benefit all pollinators. I know in my backyard pollinator garden, I'll see 10, 100 times more bees and other critters than I will ever see butterflies or monarchs. Uh, this is just a, a bee picture that I took up behind my house on a fawn, on a fawn lily. And this is that coyote mint that I mentioned. The tiger swallowtail seemed to love that. So a uh, year helping a whole, a whole array of different insects instead of just monarch butterflies by creating good pollinator habitat. Well, okay, well, that's the last slide. Here is my contact information, which uh, Renee and Kim will also be sharing to you. Uh, if you have a question, please um, don't hesitate to call me. You also might want to go on the Southern Oregon Monarch Advocate SOMA website, somonarchs.org, which we'll share that with you too. But we want to end up on a good note. So this one cartoon here says, where do you see yourself in the next five weeks? Is asking this caterpillar. And this is really good for us older people. That, because that's an old photo. The cop's looking at a picture of a caterpillar there. So, so anyway, thank you very much. And I'll turn it back over to Renee. All right. Well, thanks so much, Tom. I think we are working out. Sorry about the glitches. There. Oh, there we go. Yeah, we're working out the glitches. So um, I want to say to everyone, that was, there's so much information in that presentation, and we are happy to say um, that we've been recording it. So we will be able to send that out to you all. So you can read through those slides again to pick up some information that um, there was so much that, that went by. So you'll have that resource. And then Tom, I wanted to share with you um, the one of the questions um, was about milkweed seeds and how long they're viable. And I wanted to piggyback onto that question by asking you, you know, what's the best way to get milkweed started in your garden? Are seeds going to be typically what we find available to us, or um, are there sources for plants? Uh, the, the two milk and two species of milkweed, the showy and the narrow leaf. Our Soma group uh, collects those every fall. Uh, I've been doing that for four or five years now. Uh, so I have, for people in Northern California or Southern Oregon, they can contact me and I can get them uh, showy and narrow leaf milkweed seeds. Uh, okay. 
probably the best way right now. It's getting late. Um, milkweed, like a lot of native plants, needs to go through a cold, moist stratification, which simulates winter, so the seed needs to go through a wet and cold period. But you can do that in your refrigerator in a couple weeks and still get them in the ground. So uh, contact me. Uh, there might be some other sources of, of seed there uh, in Mount Shasta as well. Okay, and so thank you. And I know that the SOMA website lists some sources for milkweeds and also nectar plants. Um, yes. Should people expect to be able to find milkweed plants or should they expect to be looking for seeds and getting seeds started? No, no, you're not. Well, the other thing that I have a little uh, handout on is you can grow them. As I mentioned, the rhizomes, if you know where milkweed is, uh, like I say, around Mount Chester, there's a lot of showy milkweed. If you can find the old plants, you can actually dig up those rhizomes at this time of year, and they'll have just started to be sprouting, so you can actually propagate from those. So if you know where some milkweed is, go dig them up and, and put them in a pot and get those going. But yeah, the plants available. Uh, in the nurseries, they, yeah, they should be available in another couple months uh, because, again, if they're propagating from seeds, it's going to take them a while to, uh, to grow them big enough to transplant. Okay. All right. Thank you. And then we have another question, and I just want to say to folks, if you've got questions for Tom, use the Q&A window. Um, down, you'll have to go down to the bottom of your screen to find it. Um, there we go. So we've got a couple more um, popping up. So Tom, um, one of the questions is, is there a program to extend the way stations all the way from Southern Oregon to the overwintering sites in Central California? Yeah, they're just beginning to, I, I thought that the logical thing would be just to put way stations along the highway right away, like up I-5 or I-99. I mean, it goes right up the way where monarchs go. Also, the power lines, if you ever look the north-south power lines, would be a great way if, if we could get them to take those lands and, and create pollinator habitat under those. I, I know they go up there and they mow them and spray them and everything else uh, because they don't want them to grow up into the lines. But So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of potential, and I know the whole highway idea, uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of interest right now. In fact, working with the Oregon Department of Transportation, here in Medford, we're just this week putting in a uh, Monarch Way Station at the new Welcome Center, which is if you're coming down off Biscuit Pass, just at the bottom before you get into Ashland. So you'll be able to see, uh, I'll be out there planting plants this spring. So we're, we're gonna try and branch up all along I-5 again, but it's a great question. We should have way stations starting from California and just going north and east, which is right along the, migration as monarchs. Okay, all right, thanks. And another question about milkweed plants, are they picky about soil and watering? No, uh, the one thing you, they do want, they, they like full sun. So if you're going to plant them, make sure you've got a, a, a place where they get a lot of sun. But yeah, amazingly enough, around here, we've got a lot of really heavy clay soils up where I live and narrowleaf milkweed does just find in it. So uh, for, in my garden, I use regular potting soil and it, it works just fine. They're, they're really not that picky. Uh, I've seen along the uh, river uh, going down, I've seen milkweed growing right up through the cobble. So once it's established, it can grow in just about anything. But if you wanna grow it in your own, you can just use regular potting soil and it works just fine, but okay. full sun. Okay, That's all right. Okay, and then, um, I just want to share with folks, Jennifer Jones, who's with us tonight, is with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Wairika. Right. And Tom, she shared that she can make a connection for folks living in the Wairika area, that she'd be happy to connect with you for seeds. And then folks can connect with her. And Jennifer, thanks so much for offering that. We may want to um, maybe get a Mount Shasta contingent of se uh, seeds for folks in Mount Shasta and maybe just connect that way. Sure. All right. Yeah, Jen. Yeah, yeah. Jen's, Jen and I have worked for about the past four or five years. Have, no, right. Jen's a great partner to work with. Right. All right. Well, great. Let me see if we've got. Oh, um, so a question about the um, the way station up there by um, by the um, the new um, 
the highway stop, will there be will there be signs to um, indicate that that's a way station in the planting that you're putting in at the oh, new? Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll just be planting that this spring. They they have a central area where you walk in towards the bathrooms there, and they have a bunch of panels. They're going to let us take one of those and put information on that and show you exactly what the waste station is. And hopefully, we're going to get the species names on each of the plants so that you can tell what's what. So yeah. that'll be going through this year. ODOT has been really good to work with, and hopefully, we'll be creating other ones as well. Yeah, that's a really exciting partnership. Yeah. Yeah. And the same in California. I think we need to work with our transportation department and they've been really good, been really good to work with. Great. All right. Well, Tom, thank you so much. That's all the questions that have come through. Let me make sure. Oh, wait, wait. Let me see. Yep. That's all of the questions that have come through. And um, so I really want to thank you for sharing with us tonight. Um, we've got the poll up to ask if you're interested in helping in Sisson Meadow for those of you who don't live in the area, which makes up a pretty large contingent. Um, Sisson Meadow is a seven and a half acre wetland right in the heart of Mount Shasta, where um, we've done some restoration projects over the past 13 years that the Land Trust has owned Sisson Meadow. And we're really looking to um, do some restoration projects there now um, to get some plantings in that are um, exactly what Tom's been talking about this evening and we've got a little um, meadow um, wetland function project that we're also working on so um, we've got those specific projects and then we've also got sort of the long-term upkeep of the meadow and it's always good um, to see what folks are interested in and um, and we definitely have some interest from folks tonight in planting um, Monarch Way Stations. So that's great to see um, that um, looks like we've got, if I'm reading it correctly, eight folks who have said that they're interested in that. And then, um, you know, we'll also have the monitoring, the stewardship of those Monarch Way Stations. And then also just really interested in um, the citizen science project potential there in the meadow. Um, to, to do some monitoring about, um, you know, what species we see out there. So it's really neat to see that we've got some folks who are interested in that and, um, and a way that you can follow up on that is to um, use the link in the email that will come to you about volunteering. Um, it's going to send you to a link on the Siskiyou Land Trust website where you can give us your contact information and you can say, um, exactly what you're interested in helping out with. So that's um, um, a real direct way for folks to connect. 